Hello fellow classmates, my name is Megan Jones and I will be doing my presentation on Immanuel Kant, the Universalist. So morals are a big one in this chapter. Uh, the word moral comes from the Latin moralis, meaning custom, manner, or conduct. Moral refers to what people consider good or bad, right or wrong. So there are two contrasting words, non-moral and immoral. The moral-non-moral distinction is descriptive. It makes no value judgments and only distinguishes moral concerns from non-moral ones, such as economic, mechanical, nutritional issues. The moral-immoral distinction is prescriptive. It makes a value judgment about what we ought to do. The distinction between moral and immoral is equivalent to that between right and wrong, or good and bad. Moral responsibility is different from the factual issue of determining who did what. It has to do with punishment or forgiveness. Morality seems to be inseparable from responsibility. Responsibility implies freedom of choice, the ability to decide on one course of action over another, to think and behave one way instead of another. Some questions that this kind of brings up are, um, if behavior is determined by genetic influence, then how can we ever hold anyone responsible for anything? And how can we justify moral sanctions? Immanuel Kant's life. He was born in 1724 in Konigsberg, which is um, now kind of known as the former Soviet Union. His parents were poor but devout members of a fundamentalist Protestant sect known as Pietism. Pietists rejected the idea of imposing a church and priest between the individual and God, preferring to rely on immediate personal appeal to God. And they emphasized faith and repentance and lived severe Puritan, puritanical lives. When he was eight years old, Kant was sent to a school founded by a local Pietist preacher. Later in life, Kant said he resented the school's heavy emphasis on theological, or on the theology of terror and piety, which is the fear of hell um, and a trembling before a vision of a wrathful God. He never lost his regard for righteousness, however. Um, he once said that people may say what they will of Pietists. Those whom it was sincere were worthy of honor. They possessed the highest thing that men can have, the quiet, the content, the inner peace, which no suffering can disturb. At age 16, Kant entered the University of Konigsberg, where he studied for six years. Uh, leaving, after leaving the university, he refused the offer to become a Lutheran minister and chose to continue his studies instead. The next nine years he spent as a private tutor. In 1755, Kant received the equivalent of a today's doctoral degree, and he lectured at the university, again as a private tutor, um, whose salary was paid directly by his students. He became a very popular lecturer, and in 1770, the university hired Kant as a professor of logic metaphysics, and Kant was very pleased with his improved step. The solitary writer. Kant's life is noteworthy for not being noteworthy. Um, he lived most of his life on a very rigid schedule, but he was known for being a prolific writer. Some of his works include critique of pure reason, uh, along with critique of judgment, critique of practical reason, and religion within the limits of reason alone. The critique of pure reason is one of the most difficult books ever written. He wrote once that his work was the result of a reflection which occupied me for at least 12 years. He sent this manuscript to metaphysician Marcus Hers, and Hers sent it back half read and said, if I finished it, I'm, I am afraid I shall go mad. In 19, excuse me, in 1797, Kant retired from public lecturing, and Kant's work was important and troubling for it included devastating critiques of rationalism, empiricism, as well as popular theology. So we just learned about Hume's radical skepticism in chapter 10. Um, so this kind of plays into this whole scandal in philosophy that's brought up in this chapter. Um, so Hume concluded we can never know cause and effect, the self or the external world. Hume also argued the moral, that moral judgments are somehow like matters of taste. Kant was one of the first thinkers to realize the consequences of Hume's relentless attack on the scope of reason. The seeds of scandal in philosophy that Kant referred to were planted in Descartes, Descartes, specifically when he doubted his own existence and divided everything into two completely distinct substances, mind and body. 
For the continental rationalists who came after him established grand systems of logical relationships un undergrounded in observation or perception. The British empiricists chose another tact, viewing the human mind as the passive receiver of impressions and experiences. This all resulted in empiricists who began with experience unable to get back to it. The result of Hume's admission that we must believe in an external world without ever knowing it. Kant noted that something was drastically wrong with this philosophy. In response to this scandal in philosophy, Kant returned to an analysis of how knowledge is possible. He theorized that neither reason by itself nor sensation by itself can give us knowledge of the exertion. This theory is known as Kantian formalism. Theory that knowledge is the result of the interaction between the mind and sensation and is structured by regulative ideas called categories. It is also known as Kantian idealism and transcendental idealism. Kant noted that Descartes had not fully understood that the scientific method is both empirical and rational. He realized that the empiricists were guilty of a similar error of incompleteness by discounting the importance of reason. Kant said that when a theory results in conclusions that are clearly inconsistent with experience, real-world evidence must outweigh theoretical consistency. He pointed out that scientific thinking involves the activity of asking questions and framing hypotheses. Kant realized he was proposing to change fundamental assumptions about the structure of knowledge, just like Copernicus proposed a revolutionary hypothesis that the sun was at the center of the universe, not the earth at the center. Kant was advocating a Copernican revolution in philosophy. He would assume that instead of the mind having to conform to what we can, what can be known, what can be known must conform to the mind. Critical philosophy. Kant proposed a critical analysis of what kind of knowledge we actually have based on a new view of the mind as actively interacting with impressions and perceptions. Critical philosophy is the name given to Kant's effort to assess the nature and limits of pure reason in an effort to identify the actual relationship of the mind to knowledge. This pure knowledge refers to independent reasoning to knowledge not derived from the senses. Phenomena and noumena. Kant believed that our knowledge is formed by two things our actual experiences, and the mind's faculties of judgment. According to this, we cannot know reality as it is, but as the but how it is organized by human understanding. He used two terms to differentiate reality. Phenomenal reality is the term for the world as we experience it, and noumenal reality is the term for reality as it is, independent of our perceptions. This is commonly known as objective reality. We can also think of Kant's distinctions as human reality and pure reality. Kant stated that the mind imposes order on a world of things in themselves. We know they exist, but we can never know them because the mind changes things in themselves to a comprehensive form. An example of this that the book gives is of the human ear. We cannot hear the nomina, the full spectrum of air, vi air vibrations known as sound. We cannot hear the high pitches of sound that dogs hear or the low pitches that an elephant ear hears. Um, we know that they exist because of the help of the dog and the elephant ear. But we only experience what our human faculty of understanding is capable of processing. This distinction shows us the limits of human understanding. Transcendental ideas. Kant argues that although we cannot directly experience Nomina, a special class of transcendental ideas, bridges the gap between phenomenal and nominal worlds. Empirical ideas are validated by sense data, also known as experience. Whereas transcendental ideas are triggered by experience when we rely on them to impose unity on the totality of our experiences. Kant identified three transcendental ideas, self, cosmos, and God. He also called them regulative ideas because they regulate and synthesize experience on a grand scale. According to Kant, pure reason synthesizes all our physiological activities into unity by po positing the idea of self. It also attempts to lend unity to experience by synthesizing all events into a single totality or cosmos. The transcendental ideas bring up some tough questions to ponder. 
what would a person be like if they had um, no idea of self? And how real is the universe to you? Do you think or know of it as an actual existing thing? And how important and necessary do you think the idea of God is to the human mind? The objectivity of experience. Kant argued that there must be a real objective distinction between how the world seems to me and how the world is in order for me to have any experience at all. This is a complicated part of Kantian philosophy because the complexity of Kant's subject matter and his complex treatment of it. So this awareness of transcendental unity, it includes these few things. that I am aware of my own existence and identity through time. I can be aware of my identity through time because I locate myself in a world of actual existing things, and these things have the capacity to be other than I perceive them, but they are not merely my perceptions. Thus, they must exist objectively. Now, Kant himself is inconsistent in his treatment of nominal world and regulative transcendental ideas. Sometimes he talked about them as mental constructs, and other times he suggested they are existing entities. One defense of Kant's inconsistencies might be the force and power of regulative ideas. They allow us to meet our perceptive, meta our persistent metaphysical longings for an ordered, objective world, even though they might not give us a new empirical knowledge. The Metaphysics of Morals Kant distinguishes two functions of reason, which he called theoretical reason and practical reason. Theoretical reason is a function of reason confined to the empirical phenomenal world. Practical reason is the moral function of reason that provides religious feelings and intuitions based on knowledge of moral conduct. According to Kant, hypothetical imperatives are propositions that tell us what to do under specific variable conditions. They help us decide, um, they help us deal with life, but they cannot be a basis for determining moral duty. However, categorical imperatives can. According to Kant, they are a command that is universally binding on all rational creatures. They are the ultimate foundation of all moral law. Kant uses a beautiful expression to determine the moral universe, the universe of all moral beings, of all creatures possessing intrinsic worth. He refers to it as the kingdom of ends, a kingdom in which everyone is an end in himself, and no one is just a means to be used and tossed aside. This Kant formulates into the practical imperative or the principle of dignity. Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own personal, own person or in the person of another, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. We are means and ends. A Kantian theory of justice. In 1971, John Rawls, a Harvard professor, attempted to refine Kant's moral philosophy with his publication of A Theory of Justice. It became one of the most significant philosophical books of our time, greatly influencing political scientists, economic, economists, and moral philosophers. According to Rawls, the fundamental principles of justice are those principles to which free and irrational persons would agree if they were in an original position of equality. However, we are not in and cannot create a position of perfect equality. He then asked, how can we determine what justice is since any inquiry into justice will be influenced by our actual unequal circumstance? One way to deal with these limits is by a thought experiment. It is a way of using our imagination to test a hypothesis that cannot be tested in fact. We think in using reason imagination to provide the necessary conditions by for the experiment and then reasoning out the most likely consequences according to our hypothesis. Raw termed an imaginary setting in which we can identify the fundamental principles of justice from an objective, impartial perspective as the original position. Raw used the veil of ignorance as a problem-solving device that prevents us from personal considerations such as knowing our social status, what property we own, and what we like or don't like, and so on. In summary, Kant remains the major figure in modern philosophy. He has influenced modern psychology as well. Part of the power of Kant's moral philosophy lies in a deep sense that it is wrong to make ourselves the exception in moral matters. So a few of the main points that I covered um, on Kant during this presentation were his, um, his new special kind of analysis called critique, and then the distinction he made between theoretical reason and practical reason. Um, and then also um, the categories of understanding that he came up with, with the phenomenal reality and the noumenal reality. So thank you all for listening to my presentation, and I hope you got a lot out of it.